In this episode, we are going to talk about imperial ideology. As you know that imperialism did not merely create structures of political and economic domination, but in order to legitimize this domination, they had to create a series of stereotyped images and ideas on which basis the legitimacy of imperial control could be established. And in the development of imperial ideology or imperial attitudes towards the colonial world, and in this particular case, it is basically British attitudes towards India, it is not difficult to identify different stages. In the same way, we have identified different stages in uh, political expansion or in the proliferation of British economic interests as well. You uh, must be aware how the British Empire in India started fundamentally as a mercantile empire. Then India was deployed as a recipient of finished goods and a very secure area of investment once imperial control was firmly established in the early part of the 19th century. So the impact of such changes in the nature of imperial control was also manifest in what we call changes in imperial ideology. And that is where this entire discussion on Orientalism actually features as a point of entry into the particular attitude that the British had adopted towards India in the later half of the 18th century, in the early stage of imperial uh, rule, when the British were not uh, so confident about the future of the empire, they had to come to terms with powerful Indian classes, they had to come to terms with Indian vulnerabilities, Indian beliefs, and Indian practices. So this is what has always been described as the phase of Orientalism in British policy. In a way, one may argue that Orientalism in British policy was the consequence of a relatively weak empire. Once the empire became strong in the early part of the 19th century, and there are clear markers. You have in 1813 the Charter Act, which opened up India for free exploitation by the free merchants. Then you have 1817, James Mill publishes his History of British India in which he celebrates the civilizing role of the British in India to turn India into a new West. Once British control in the early part of the 19th century became firmly established, this earlier policy, which is called Orientalism, which is basically encouraging the British officials to learn Indian languages, to become acclimatized in Indian conditions, to become assimilated in the Indian environment, as the great historian David Cobb, who has written on this subject, would put it. And this was discarded in favor of what James Mill actually envisages, a new policy of uh, wholesale reform, westernization, etc. Uh, sir, then how does one explain this shift from Orientalism to Westernization? Uh, I have suggested, although we have not elaborated on this, if Orientalism was the expression of a less confident empire, a less arrogant imperialism, an imperialism which is still not very certain about its future, imperialism which is still encountering re local resistance, uh, which is still compelled by circumstances to maintain or to draw on resources from Indian collaborators. And Anglicism or Westernization is the ideological articulation of a more confident imperialism. When Indian resistance had been completely removed and the British had become so confident about their ability or their, about the longevity of their rule that they were now posing as the civilizers of the empire. And there are also uh, certain associated changes which can be cited as the reason why this shift was taking place, apart from the political logic that I have given. So if you look at the first generation of British civil servants here, basically those people who are known as company wallas, they came usually at a fairly young age. They often married into local society, kept Indian wives. There is a famous painting of Warren Hastings actually smoking uh, hookah and on a bajra. 
So that is a different kind of cultural environment. People came from ordinary backgrounds. They were not men from aristocratic classes. They came for here to make some money, to go make fortune, came at a young age, became more assimilated naturally in the Indian environment. So this environment uh, no longer existed in the early part of the 19th century. You have a new crop of officials coming from the close of the 18th century, men from relatively upper class backgrounds, aristocratic backgrounds. You now have Marquises and the Lords coming to India as rulers of India. Cornwallis is uh, one of the earliest examples, then followed by Marquis of Wellesley. So such men were not expected to imbibe the kind of attitude that you would come across in a man like Warren Hastings or his generation. These men were anxious to not merely to establish the superiority of the British in India, but also eventually in the early part of the 19th century to create India in a new mold. You have, uh, for example, a man like Benting in close association with Thomas Babington Macaulay. These people were actually representing a completely new philosophy of imperialism, which took upon itself the role of the civilizer, the civilizing mission as the as the idea goes, the French call it mission civilisatrice. So that, I think, is a very important change in attitude. And this attitude was to some extent uh, caused by the discovery by the British that they had invented a completely new more of a life, new ways of life. Industrialization, for example, in England had given them an idea that the British had discovered a completely new way of life. So that is the reason why I say that the shift from Orientalism to Westernism, which I, I, I was actually suggesting, by way of explaining the answer to your question, uh, one has to add the other point that in course of time, however, some of these ideas which are generated in this early phase of imperial research into Indian society and knowledge would uh, create varied meanings, create completely different kind of meaning to which we turn later. Because we can see how the Orientalist discovery of some of the basic traits of Indian civilization and society would become a certain weapon, would become the resource in the hands of those who started claiming that India didn't deserve a representative government or self-government on the ground, that it was a changeless, it was a stagnant society. But there you have see a completely different meaning of Orientalism, which is why before we come to what actually these ori early Orientalist scholars were actually discovering as some of the basic features of Indian society or civilization, it is important to consider an important intervention in this entire discussion on imperial ideology or imperial attitudes to the colonial world in this famous work of Edward Syeth called Orientalism, which was published in 1978. Syeth's basic argument was that in order to establish the legitimacy of imperialism, the West created a set of ideas, images, in order to underline a certain unbridgeable difference between the East and the West. Syed actually doesn't consider even the time and place dimension. He says that this is a kind of a discourse, this is a kind of a mindset which you can trace back to antiquity. So Herodotus were, was actually describing the Persians as barbarians. So you have a series of medieval or late medieval, early model travel writings in which this difference was underlined. But when British or European colonial empires began to expand, these ideas became important resources for imperialism to underline, to stress the distinction between the East and the West in such a manner that the inferiority of the East would become the justification for the presence of a superior West as rulers, superior racially, superior intellectually, 
superior in terms of discovery of new kind of knowledge that science had created in the meanwhile in Europe, discoverer of technology, discoverer of industry, or discoverer of a more civilized kind of government that these people were finding absent in India or in other parts of the Asiatic world. So how does one actually identify the basic features on which basis one would actually distinguish between the East and the West and would emphasize then the unbridgeable difference between the East and the West. So one is culture of despotism. They were arguing that in Europe, a civilized monarchy had flourished. Civilized monarchy would allow people enough property, would actually allow laws to rule, would allow people to accumulate wealth. Despotism is different. Despotism would not allow people private property, private wealth. Laws will not be enforced regardless of the discretion of the rulers. If there is no rule of law in a condition of despotism, you have this particular feature of changelessness that Indians were resistant to change. And this idea of changelessness would recur over and over again. But as I was, yes, yes. Uh, sir, if this is so, then how does one explain the difference between William Jones and James Mill? Uh, that is a very crucial point. James Mill would say that whatever discovery that the Orientalists were making about the great Indian heritage had no relevance. Because ultimately, India had declined. And the decadence was of such kind that they demanded the intervention by imperialism to remove these uh, backlogs or remove these uh, drags in order to make Indian society more dynamic, to make it more receptive to change, to make it more responsive to change, while India was changeless. So how does one do it? They would say that each person should be secure in property. It is not as if that Mill was the only proponent of this kind of a position. Even Marx would say that under despotism, property didn't exist. And since property didn't exist, there was no incentive for innovation and enterprise. And since enterprise didn't exist, there was no increase in wealth. So in order to increase wealth, in order to make society more dynamic, in order to draw out peasants from their small uh, egalitarian or self-sufficient communities, it was important to introduce modern notions of property, property that would give them incentive to enter into market, to enter into market relationships, produce for the market, earn enough money to be able to grow as wealthy people. So that is where Mills and others as utilitarians were trying to locate the possibilities of change. For example, Indian education system, and one has to have utilitarian education. This is something which we'll discuss later. But however much these Orientalists were actually trying to glorify the great Indian heritage, the great excellence that Indian classical poetry had achieved, Kalidasa had achieved, all these had no relevance because ultimately, or oh, despite that great heights that India had achieved in the in antiquity in the classical age, India by the 19th century had become a stagnant water. And in order to make it once again dynamic, they needed the imperial intervention. So you have a series of reforms. You have a new educational reform whereby men like Macaulay and Benting would have people to be exposed to modern scientific ideas, to modern technology. Ideas from the West should be important in order to make them more receptive to modern ideas, modern philosophical concepts liberalism, individualism. So that is the James Mill position. But then you have William Jones, who would say that Kalidasa was the Shakespeare of India. I mean, you have these great heights that Indian civilization had achieved in antiquity. William Jones would say, India was Europe's past. I mean, you have comparisons. So the Indian uh, religion, which was, a, which was a, an object of attack, which was a target of criticism by the reformers, by the utilitarians, by the Christian evangelists, by the missionaries, William Jones would say, oh, yes, of course, this is a sign of decadence. 
But then if you go back into your past, you can see the comparison. I mean, Indian deities are easily comparable to Roman or Greek gods and goddesses. So India, William Jones was the, was the progenitor or was the creator of a certain discipline called comparative religion. Uh, so sir, is this the specific contribution of William Jones to Orientalist thinking? Uh, this is just one aspect. There are many other aspects. For example, William Jones, in order to establish a certain commensality between Indians and the Europeans, came up first with the idea of the Indo-European language family. That ultimately, the whole idea that the Aryans had migrated via Iran, once some of them came to India and others went to Europe. So they came from a common stock, this, that there are linguistic similarities. So comparative language is also another very important sphere where William Jones actually excelled. But more importantly, William Jones, following the example of another Orientalist before him, Nathaniel Hallett, or Warren Hastings before Hallett. Warren Hastings didn't believe that India was, didn't have any laws. Warren Hastings, unlike many of his contemporaries, believed that Indian legal system requires to be understood by learning Indian languages, and which is basically this attitude led to the foundation of the Fort William College, where English uh, civil servants were expected to learn Indian languages, learn Indian laws, the many customs which had the force of laws. So in order to understand the, the, these Indian legal system, they felt that the British had to learn the languages. So there was all these Sanskrit colleges or these madrasas where Persian studies and Sanskrit studies, studies were encouraged. So William Jones became a very important Sanskrit scholar. Already in England, he had learned Arabic and Persian. When in India, he began to learn Sanskrit. And the need to understand or to need to learn Sanskrit was occasioned by his role as an official, as a judge of the Supreme Court. And whenever there were property disputes in the court between litigants, William Jones had to summon someone who is proficient in these Indian texts, or Dharma Shastras in order to find out the Shastric foundation of the Indian legal system, canonical uh, laws. How, how did the Shastras define the right to property? How did the Shastra define, define who is going to get which share from the property at the time of the death of a person? All these questions came up for settlement by a judge of the Supreme Court of Calcutta, and he summoned these Indian pundits who acted as Jones's collaborator gave them, gave him some ideas about the Shastras, gave him the initial access to this knowledge, on which basis he developed a certain interest in the language, which eventually led him towards the study of comparative language, comparative religion, and uh, some celebration of uh, classical poetry. He, as you know, he translated Abhigyana Sakuntalam into English language. So Jones, uh, certainly represents the best that Orientalist scholarship had produced at that stage, but Jones had been preceded by men like Halhead, who had published a code of gentle laws by following the same procedure. Vivada Arnava Setu, that is the original text which he translated into English to create the code of gentle laws. And you have Warren Hastings before him, who thought that there was a need for the British to know the Indian tradition better in order to rule India better. So there is this logic of governance, which had something to do with Orientalism as a body of knowledge. But this logic of governance, as I said, would change once the British Empire would become more confident. When Macaulay would come up with that kind of a very arrogant statement that Indians would retain their color, but in all other senses, they would become Englishmen. So that's a different kind of imperialism. But we are talking about a time when imperialism was uh, very different, was more cautious, and therefore uh, it was the glorious time of the Orientalist. And ultimately, Orientalism, as you know, has, um, was going to be somewhat marginalized and eclipsed by the Anglicizers of the 1820s and 1830s.
But there is another dimension in this Orientalist search for Indian knowledge or the knowledge about India's past literature, language or antiquity. That is the collaboration between the Indians and the British. It is not as if that the British had decided on their own what they are going to study. Important contributions were made by local pundits. Local pundits gave them the proper understanding. I mean, the manner in which they understood Indian society to a large extent was molded by their informants themselves. So each one of these great Orientalist scholars, like Colin Mackenzie in South India, or William Jones in Calcutta, they had their institutions like Ishaaric Society or... But this role of these local informants, the local of the role of these local collaborators of these British scholars have lately been recognized. But as I said, this is not the only thing that Orientalism is all about. This Orientalism also created a state of mind. However much actually you make this distinction between James Mill and William Jones, both of them believed that India was inferior that there was a degree of inferiority. Somebody would say that India was Europe's past. While Europe had surged forward, India didn't progress. Some would believe that since India was completely held down by this past, it was important for Indians to forget the past entirely and to search forward, following the examples of the British. That was the position of the Westernizers. But one Indian would come up and say that what are you going to teach us? We have everything. I mean, if you are telling us that we didn't have a democratic tradition, we had a democratic tradition. The kind of historical research or the archaeological research that this early Orientalism had promoted in the early part of the 19th century created a more acute sense of history among Indians at the close of the 19th century when this Indian scholarship came up with their own version of Orientalism by claiming not merely great heritage, but at the same time constantly engaging with the West by suggesting that all that has been labeled as Western and therefore not appropriate for India had existed in Indian tradition. Indians had science, Indians had democracy. So one historian would go back to the Vedic times to claim that in ancient India you have Savas and Samitis which represented democratic institutions. So there is no point for the British to say that Indians actually didn't have a democratic heritage. We had an Indian heritage, Indian democratic heritage, as a man like K.P. Jaisawal was trying to argue in the early part of the 20th century. So there is an element of politics in it. Sir, are you arguing that more than the fund of knowledge that Orientalism is generating, it is the political motivation behind the different interpretation of Orientalism? Uh, partly you are right, because I am trying to suggest that despite the many differences that existed between William Jones or say James Mill, they still agreed on one point that India was different. One might say that India had a great uh, history behind it and they, that needed to be um, admired. But still Jones would say that there was a period of decadence. The Aryan virility, the Aryan creativeness had declined. So a point which was going to be repeated in the late 19th century by ethnologists who would suggest, methodologists like Harvard Risley, for example, who would suggest that as a consequence of the racial mingling between the Aryans and the non-Aryans, the Aryan creativity, virility, the greatness had been eroded. So Mill's point would be that if it was a decadent society, if it had was a retrograde society, changeless, static, then how was it that this stainless, static society should be made more dynamic? And one set of people or one generation who followed James Mill would actually completely alter the meaning of Orientalism by suggesting that, all right, you have a great history, but that history has not been so useful for keeping you a dynamic society. And you, in order to make you dynamic, you have to go to the West. But then you have a new kind of Orientalism among nationalists who would suggest that we didn't have anything to learn from the West. 
whatever the West apparently had been teaching us was there in our own tradition. If the West was teaching us that we were not deserving of democracy because we were a culture of despotism, it is a very skewed judgment because in our history we have democratic institutions. So there are many meanings of the same assumptions, something which Syed didn't consider adequately, that you have a set of assumptions about difference between India and the West. Some people might say that this difference needed to be bridged in order to make India a new West. Some people would say that India was so change resistant, India was so incorrigibly impervious to change that such difference could never be bridged. You may remember Kipling, the East is the East and the West is West and the twin shall never meet. So that was the particular psychology of those officials in the late 19th century who drew on this Orientalist assumption about the difference between the East and the West as they learned from their predecessors, as it has been explicated later in Syed's work. But then they were actually making out this kind of a position at a time when the British, fearful about the possibility of another mutiny, did not wish to carry on with their social reform program. It's a different generation, which was departing from the manner in which had Mill had used the idea of difference, trying to bridge it, espousing a strategy where the difference was accepted as so sacrosanct that this was unbridgeable. The difference was so unbridgeable that there was no need to introduce any changes. But then you have the Indian Orientalism lurking in the background. That you look at our own tradition, look at our own history. Whatever you are actually suggesting we lack, we, we lack, we had it. So it is important simply to revive them. So that is where you can see the kind of knowledge that the collaboration between Indian pundits and the European officials in the early part of the 19th century had created in language studies, in history, in, in archaeology, were capable of generating varied meanings. And that takes us to utilitarianism, how utilitarian vision of a dynamic India cast in a new Western world was basically drawing on similar assumptions, assumptions about India's changelessness or India's decadence that had been formed at an early time. So to recapitulate, you have to make a clear distinction between Orientalism as a matter of policy that came to be discarded in the, in the 1820s and Orientalism as a state of mind where you have certain attitudes persisting over a long duration of time, persisting well into the late 19th century, carrying on, acquiring different meanings. You have a nationalist orientalism, you have a conservative imperialist orientalism, trying to turn one's face away from all possibilities of change. You have a more aggressive, arrogant, but liberal reformist orientalism, where you look upon India as inferior, but you don't consign India to a position of permanent inferiority, you wish to reform it. So that is the fun with Orientalism. You have different sets of meanings. You have the different ways through which certain assumptions could be deployed by different generations for different purposes.